welcome everybody. It's really lovely that you come see this panel about hundred, a hundred years. Feels like a hundred years of punk fans in the <laughs> Actually, it's actually ten. <laughs> but what a ten they were, right? So, um, allow me to have the first of all, me, moi and I, my name is Vivian Goldman. They call me the punk professor because I teach the punk course at NYU and related courses. But as Toby and Jolly will attest, I was very involved in the original first wave of punk in London. And uh, so little did I know that it would be a sort of passion that would endure for a lifetime and we would wind up, right Toby? Sitting in art galleries, discussing it, right Jolly? Who knew? Who knew? So. Uh, first of all, we're going to show this lovely film that in how many minutes? Three minutes? So, I think a few more than that, maybe. But anyway, 750 fans So, oh. while it, Jolly has found this film, while it starts, we will continue to talk a little bit because I think you're from the generation that can do two things at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so really down. Yeah, we don't need the sound. The sound is just generic. But when you see this film, uh, you know, you'll get a fantastic slice of fanzine <laughs> life. I mean, nobody's ever seen anything like it. Actually, no, let's... Let's have the sound come on. Okay. okay. This really will set the scene from what we've seen. So let them watch it, Toby. It's going to be fun. <laughs> of the world of zines. So now let me introduce my panellists. Number one on the far left, punk legend Jolly McPhee of punkpast.com. And then we have Michael Gonzalez, a fantastic writer and, no he is, and <laughs> and noted blogger. Please tell them the link to your blog. It's called blackadelicpop.com. Blackadelicpop.com and you won't regret visiting it. <laughs> so as, as you realize, we're gathered here together to celebrate this particular book, right? And the essay, the longer essay in this book is written by the panelist on my right, Vic Brand. Without whom we actually literally wouldn't be here today, no joke, Toby Mott, he's not only an original punk, not only an original artist with a true punky spirit, but he's also an archivist who put this fantastic collection together that is touring the world and enabling us to talk really today about what punk means today and what relevance it has and what was so great about that work that you'll see next door. <laughs> So, um, before we go any further, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this actual book. Because, you know, I've worked with Toby before, and this is a new artifact, right, Toby? Yes, in fact, it was launched at the fair to coincide with the exhibition, and um, 
So yeah, it's now here. And it's 10 years of British Pound, and I was, I mean, because I was around at the time, I often get a bit emotional looking yeah. at these things, sort of things like we used to have up on our kitchen wall and so on. But the way that Toby did it is, is very clever. <laughs> And he not only puts in what you'd expect to see from an era, but also tangential things that really bring an era to life. And before we go any further, may I just show us my favorite here? Nobody really expects to see this in the 1976 Steve Hillage, okay? I don't even know if you know who Steve Hillage is. No. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve Hillage was an uber hippie. And people always say that punk was really against hippie, but it wasn't literally like that on the ground, was it? No, but what's interesting is this fanzine. Um, the reason these were included in the year of 76 is because I guess it's widely agreed that um, the first punk fanzine is Sniffing Glue, which was 1976, this. And you can see they've got Blue Oyster Cult on the cover. Oh, oh, that is but um, to actually find 10 fanzines from 1976 was impossible. But this one has got a very interesting article. It's called New Wave. We only did the covers in the book. But inside is a whole piece by Mark Perry, who published Sniffing Glue. And uh, the other fanzines, which aren't maybe, they're fanzines, and that's why they're in here. But uh, within 76, there were only the few here, because we're just talking about British punk fanzines. This one is very interesting, because it's uh, by Shane McGowan from the Pogues, who won a scholarship to one of the best schools in Britain, the Westminster Public School. And while he was there, he published this <laughs> bondage. In, um, it's in early 76, and then obviously he went on to uh, found the Pogues. But he was in a band called the Nippler Rectors and um, <laughs> prior to that. So and he's he, a he got his ear bitten off and be thus became the punk legend. Yeah. Where well, you went around with Tilly you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a famous incident at the Hundred Club. But uh, we're going to sort of move swiftly around through these people, but just quickly, Toby, you were a punk. What did it mean to you and why did you put this collection together? Okay, well, I was a punk and. Um, I'm, I wasn't a musician, I was just a kid, and uh, I identified with punk because I came from a kind of dysfunctional family, and punk was the dysfunctional family that embraced me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for all the other kids, uh, like myself, we kind of ended up as punks, going to punk clubs, and punk was a culture that uh, embraced everything, so there was a, a club, we had our publications, which are fanzines. We obviously had our music. So it was a kind of total identity for those who didn't feel that they belonged to the, the dominant culture. So me and my twin brother, we were punks. And my two sisters, we were like a, grew up in central London, and we were like a punk family. And I was like 13. And um, I just say, the one thing about punk that I look at now, instead of it being a destructive thing, it was incredibly creative. And that is why, it, uh, to me, it's so important and um, what kind of propels me to do these shows. Because um, obviously it was a musical phenomenon, but all other aspects of it, including obviously like Vivian Westwood. The aesthetic. Yeah. Good. And um, part of Vic, how much research did you have to do to write your essay? Or did, was it something you've been digesting for a long time? Um, well, so I was born in 76, so um, <laughs> punk, punk, punk was the, maybe maybe a noise in the background. Yeah. Um, but um, the, what interests me about uh, the zines in particular and in terms of the research, um, I have uh, some experience just with um, underground publishing and with artist publishing. Um, and so what was very interesting to me about punk and the zines in particular is that it's this very indigenous kind of grassroots expression um, that is, you know, the, to, to do something to make a publication on a Xerox machine is a, there's a very low financial barrier. There's, a, <laughs> there's no, like, creative criteria. You just, it's just something that you have to sit down and commit your, your time to doing. And so um, that's one of the things that was most interesting to me and in terms of the research. Um, there are some. There were some very good uh, books about uh, punk in the UK. England's Dreaming. Yes. Uh, John Sorry, Savage John. is a uh, was a really excellent resource. Um, and then was just based on 
my perusal of his collection and just what I happen to have in my head already about um, how people with no money and um, just nothing really more than the will to do it decide to go put together a publication. That's very beautifully put. Vic did the Crass publication, a show we did earlier this year about Crass. We did a publication and Vic did the research on that. So. I think that, he's, uh, that was a good primer. And what do you think? And what do you think? Because Vic works now at the Huffington Post, so he's got a regular job in the real world. But what? I <laughs> <laughs> like some of us in this room. But you know, what does uh, you know? How does punk inspire you in your day to day? What do you think? Are we more appeals to you about this idea of punk and the aesthetic of Um Well, I, I mean, I think that at root, that that punk is was a was a youth movement. Quite fundamentally, it was a youth movement. It was 16-year-old kids. It was kids like Toby. I mean, it was it was people who weren't very pleased with what the mainstream was doing, and then they decided we need an alternative to this, and so th they just went out essentially and, and did it yeah. um, with. I mean, the music there you needed no no musical talent. You just needed to have an instrument, you know. You, to, do, to do the zine, you needed nothing more than a felt tip pen and access, not even necessarily to pay for the Xerox machine. If you had a friend who worked at a, at a, at a printing place, you sneak in 11 o'clock at night and you would run it off 100 copies and staple it and then you would do it all yourself by hand because you were a, you know, a student, and you didn't even have to be a good student, but you could just you know, sl slam it all together because you had the time to do it and, and start to kind of form your own culture. Um, and you know, that is, it, it's, it's very strangely entrepreneurial. I mean, I'm sure that none of the kids, when they're thinking about it, think to themselves that this is something that I'm doing because I expect to get anything out of it. It's, more, it's so much more purely cultural and, and then, you know, just trying, trying to define that identity in this, in, in a, a dominant culture that you aren't comfortable yeah. in. Yeah, so that's a lesson for us all in these times when everybody's trying to reinvent themselves and find a way through, right? right. That's kind of so, <laughs> Michael, Michael. And I think, what, you know, from having been doing this punk professor thing for a while, I've noticed there's a couple of areas where between England and America, often people don't understand each other. And one of them will come to later, so that gives you a reason to hang around. But one of them, um, Michael, I think, will be able to articulate very well because Michael is a child of the hip hop generation, right? Yes. And yet you too were formed by punk <laughs> and fan things. Maybe you can explain to the people how and why that worked. Well, I, I grew up in New York. I grew up in, in Harlem and you know lived uptown most of my life. Uh, when I was in college, I started hanging out downtown and going to various clubs, going to Mud Club or CDs or Danceteria. But also a lot of what was going on in hip hop started moving downtown. It started moving from different venues, the Disco Fever or Broadway International, and started playing in these different venues. And you know, so hip hop and punk kind of overlapped in a sense. You know, there were a lot of punk kids who went to hip hop shows. You know, especially the early days with Africa Bombada and, you know, Malcolm McLaren in various interviews and on record has talked about his, uh, he and Bombada being friends and Bombada bringing him up to the Bronx in some kind of way. And I guess because, you know, punk and, and hip hop kind of shared the same sort of aesthetic of making something out of nothing. Yes. You know, making do with what you had. And, um, and at the same time, you know, these, um, shows were going on at the same time. So um, I, I got invited by, I met a bunch of punks, I don't know if even remember where, because it was so long ago. But they were putting out a fanzine, and I knew what fanzines were, because I used to write for a, a comic book fanzine. I grew up collecting comics, so they were comic fanzines. So I knew what fanzines were, but this was my introduction to punk fanzines. And they wanted someone, not. You know, they had the punk scene covered. They wanted someone to write about hip hop for their magazine, for their fanzine. So right? they acknowledged the kinship. Yes. And what you're saying yes. is that punk created a space for you to find Ex yourself in exactly. your own voice. Exactly. And it was it was really cool because I had no, you know, to me, I thought a magazine was something that cost, you know, a lot of money to do and blah blah blah. And basically, we put this magazine together. They would get it 
printed somewhat professionally because one of the guys, R.W. Powers, who was the publisher, worked at some kind of printing company. So he would do it and do a nice little layout, but it wasn't like, you know, there were no computers, so everything was done by hand. And basically, um, I think I wrote, I think, I'm not sure how many issues there were, but I remember writing for two issues. Uh, the first issue and the second issue. And basically, we would have a party, um, you know, drink a lot of beer, smoke a lot of weed, and put this magazine together. Yeah, <laughs> that's the fuck you know. So, you know, groups like Public Enemy yes. I was writing about, or Fishbone, that kind of had a punk hip hop thing going on at the same time. Well, Chuck from Public Enemy actually wrote a whole article, didn't he, about his debt to punk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, and there were a lot of punks at Public Enemy shows. Yes. I mean, you know, I remember when they used to do the new music seminar. Yeah. And if you would go to the Ritz or Irving Plaza or wherever these shows were, mm -hmm. a lot of the, I'm not saying 50%, yeah. but there was a lot. There was a communality. Yes, yeah. yes there was. And Hannah, we're turning to Jolly, who in many respects is really yes. like the godfather of punk. I'm not joking. Because I was around at the time, and this man, no seriously, because he was making the stuff. You know, the yes. badges, the... Mm -hmm. the Jolly, please explain is, you know, your role in punk. Well, what I'll say is, you know... In five I was, words I was, or less. You know, I was not a punk. I was a hippie. And, uh, and I, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born in 1950, I was 13, when I was 13, which is the age when you're imprinted by music, I was into the pretty things who were like this, you know, really rave up band, I sort of followed them, and, and when I became aware of punk, I would say, it would be in about 1967, when, um, band called The Social Deviants put out a, a, a DIY 45 yeah. called Way The Social Deviants of Big Farron called, called uh, Let's Loot the Supermarket yeah. and, uh, and and uh, and there was a, you know the, the alternative press and so on and I went on to like eventually hook up with those people by about 1970 and there was a band called Pink Fairies and Hawkwind and we we had an attitude of being anti the sort of corporate record labels and doing our own thing and playing for free and doing this kind of thing. And what happened at that time was hippie kind of split into one, two, two veins. And one was the sort of Aquarian thing. And, utopian. Uh, utopian. And the other one was kind of very urban. And, uh, and in fact, we brought over the MC5 in 1970 to play a festival. And it inspired a lot of people. And later when Iggy Pop came. And so there was the, the two strands, but, uh, which kind of inspired us uh, for, for music. And, and by about 1974, things had gone down because they'd had, you'd had the oil crisis, the inflation, the whatever, and things got very bad, little record shops shut down, and so there was a kind of void for nothing. And then when Punk came in 76, it, um, it was kind of like the chickens coming home to roost. And I remember thinking at the time, this is all the kids that are coming to the Punk shows had older brothers that were into, like, I think, Fairies and Hawkwind. You know, or, and in fact, when they were like 13 years old, they were into yeah. like, they, they were into T-Rex, but they were also in, you know, this kind of thing. And so, and, and so it started to happen. But to actually get you to just it. Just tell people what you actually did and on, on what, uh, because it was partly, as Vic points out in his essay, the invention of the photocopier, and there's well, things then, like this, that. This is the so other tell point. People what you know, you as far did. as printing goes, you know, so, People started doing screen printing in the, in, in the 60s, and so you could make posters. And so posters was the only real medium that you could do wonderful psychedelic posters. And then you had alternate, alternative press, where you had cheaper web offset LIFO, but it was just the alternative to the newspapers. And it was only in, in the 70s that suddenly these new technologies came, mm -hmm. which were not only printing, but they started twin cassette decks, so you could actually start duping off, making mixes. And so people started, this, this was the beginning of peer-to-peer -peer culture where people could like start spreading stuff amongst themselves rather than it coming down from the top, be it alternative or, or central. And then, and then they brought out these new Xerox machines um, and so the cost of Xerox dropped from like a buck to like 10 cents. And then it, with printing, printing got a lot cheaper. They started a thing called instant print and little print shops started opening up everywhere where the cost of making a plate used to be like 100 bucks to make, to make a plate. So the cost of making a plate went down to like, you know, 10 bucks, or even they started making paper plates that were like a buck. Mm -hmm. And so this was, this for the first time in history meant that basically publishing 
was in the hands of everybody. Now, in one, in very brief time, tell them what you, you, surely, <laughs> did. Because we've only got ten more minutes, chaps, of us talking, and then it's open to the floor. So, so one of the things that the MT5 brought with them was they were the white pants and they brought buttons. <coughs> and we were very into buttons, and so I started making badges in 76. And the first punk rock show was the Ramones at the Roundhouse. I went and made Ramones badges, and I never looked back from there. But the thing about it was that the irony is that badges, you know, or buttons, you know, you can print 24 on a sheet and you can sell each one for like 20p. For the fanzine, you have to print 24 sheets and, you know, with, and, and you can only sell that for the same price. And we used to say, you know, the people used to come and sell fanzines off my stand at the roundhouse and I'd sell like, you know, a, th a thousand badges and they'd sell like, you know, 20 fancy. So actually what you're saying is that in those days you could actually like make money with this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was, you know, it's money, but uh, yes, no. But well, one thing I didn't mean to say, but uh, I was very excited we're doing this right now. Jeanette Beckman, legendary punk photographer, is in the house. Yay, Jeanette! <laughs> and, <laughs> and she brought us this, which is right from today, ripped from the headlines from what's happening downtown in Wall Street. It's like a sort of fanzine of now. So I think it's sort of very relevant to now to be thinking about these punk fanzines. As Rick was saying, really the people were able to seize the media for almost, you know, one of the first times since the invention of the printing press. Now, Toby. Toby was originally an artist when I first knew him in the hip-hop era of the 80s. And then he became very involved with this uh, fanzines project and I see now that somehow working with the fanzine sparked something off that has led him back to making art. Please tell us about how the fanzines got you to that place and tell us what your art was like then and now in five words or less. Um, <laughs> in the early 80s I was in an art group called the Grey Organisation and we showed at Civilian Warfare at Lower East Side Gallery or East Village Gallery in 1984, and then I stayed in New York and ended up working um, for like Tommy Boy Records. I did the Dilla Soul album cover and worked with bands like Information Society and Tribal Quest, Public Enemy, and numerous. And this is the kind of beginning of hip hop before it became like the dominant culture. It was uh, rock was the dominant culture, like Harris Smith and stuff, and hip hop was the New York thing. This is before the West Coast. Anyway. I did end up moving to Los Angeles, but uh, more recently I put together a big archive um, called uh, Loud Flash British Punk on Paper, and it tours around the world, um, with the, the kind of trying to show that the history and development of punk from '76 to the uh, advent of Thatcherism in '79. So while working with this material, it has kind of inspired me. Uh, to move away from running my fashion company to painting again. Mm -hmm. And I have a show in London at the moment called Unrest, which I kind of put together since the riots and this kind of dichotomy of the, the which you have in America with the kind of Wall Street types bankrupting the nation with their kind of greed and um, the, their motives um, of kind of selfishness. And then what's happened in Britain is the underclass, or those who can't afford all this stuff that is continually promoted, decided to just take it. So we had the riots of this summer. So um, in some way, you know, I'm not entirely sympathetic with that because I'm quite middle class and bourgeois, but <laughs> I can see the rage and the anger of the, of the, the underclass, which in Britain probably yeah. unaware in America, but it's quite divided. It's, it's like, like America, it's rich and poor, and the middle is kind of evaporated. So um, it kind of, I was inspired from working with my punk material mm -hmm. and to this kind of event, and uh, I put together a, an exhibition of paintings, and that's kind of my, which I haven't had a show of my paintings for 15 years. Yes. And now I've got another show when I get back. So. Um, yeah, it inspires me in working with this punk material. It is, I mean, here you have Warhol, which I, walking around the fair, just about everything references Warhol. And uh, I can, um, you know, I like Warhol, and I sympathize with where you just reflect on the culture. But punk was a bit different. It was a new culture, and that's I guess that's what's inspired me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's very good, Toby. That's very well. I just made it up then. <laughs> just like that, and you, you're president. Uh, birth of the idea. So, Vic, now I have a title of your project here. Vic was a did this book in numbers, serial publications by artists since 1955. That's the sort of passion of his. And, you know, in a way, uh, it, it sort of touched me, it tied in with the fanzines away, perhaps because of just the volume of material. But how do you see those punk feelings manifesting today in publishing, in individual publications? Do you tie it with the internet? Um, I mean, certainly the, the internet is, uh, I mean, the technological equivalent to the Xerox machine. I mean, there's there's really no barrier at all to get on the internet and sign up for a website and just start um, self-expressing, which is basically to to a degree what the what the punks were about. Though um, it, there is a part of me that thinks that the punk zines were really more of an extension of uh, the underground press. I mean, it was it was simply that the, uh, as Jolly was saying, absolutely, and that and that it was that it was that. That, that that lower bar to the technology that suddenly let a lot of other people do it because I think that if you look at the zines themselves they're actually modeling themselves after other music magazines and the, the way they're set up in terms of the you know they have a big section yeah. about reviews and they have a big you know reviews of shows and interviews with bands I mean they're, they're so kind of focused on it that it's to a degree it's not about self-expression it's it they're just they're caught up in the culture and that yeah. and, and that I mean, and which isn't to say that there isn't some of that, but it, it's they're they're modeling the dominant culture, but expressing their new ideas through those same forms, and that so con in terms of in contemporary terms, um, yeah, I mean the, the internet would be that thing because there's just there's nothing to get in the way of that, and you know the the, the distribution the the what the zines did do was was to set up these. Kind of channels for, uh, of, for scenes to communicate with one another, um, so that you know London yeah. could, could talk to Manchester or, or wherever it was, and so these that geographical isolation as the bands toured and, and kids went to shows, they could you know things circulated yeah, through the mails, um, and so that's definitely in terms of the um, the other project I worked on. That fundamentally, any of these publications are are ways of getting in touch with like-minded people and forming a community. Um, and again, that's basically what the, the internet did. If, if the internet had been around in the 70s, um, people we've wouldn't been have been using. wasting their time with the Xerox machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, again, well observed. <laughs> so Michael, yes. one of Michael's, you know, Michael's blog is so worth reading. It's one of the only ones I really always do. And uh, one of his passions is Basquiat. He's very knowledgeable about art. So I was wondering how you see the punk aesthetic filtered into that generation of people like Basquiat, maybe Keith Haring, well, I mean, and the thing maybe of, Kenny Scharf. Those names ring a bell around these parts? Yeah. Right. I mean, Basquiat, it's kind of funny because Basquiat was from Brooklyn and was living on the Lower East Side, so he kind of came out of, you know, quote unquote, early days of hip hop, you know, being friends with Fat Five Freddy and all these guys that kind of introduced him to the sound, as well as being a quote unquote graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't a graffiti artist in the way that, you know, Dondi was a graffiti artist, but he was still on the streets and still doing his thing. I think he felt the punk thing. Did I you, think, did well, you guys know, were aware of it? it was, was yeah, I mean, because he was on the Lower East Side. So and, you know, because this is what was going on, I mean, if you watch um, uh, Downtown 81, I mean, it's basically a, 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 a overlapping of punk and hip hop, and you know he he goes to see Richard Hell and Fat Five Freddy, and you know it, it becomes a part of the whole film. You know, so when Basquiat later on started making music, I mean he was making he was doing a lot of splicing, a lot of editing, a lot of stuff that would later become staples in hip hop. Mm -hmm. But then the, his group Noise was making music that would be probably more equivalent to what punk was. Than, what hip hop was. So it's actually, to me, I see it in a way as a very much a sight guys thing because of those of us who love Fela Kuti and Afrobeat. That rings a bell? Anybody here? You know, that was all happening at the same time as punk. Jolly. Now, out of all of us, Jolly is the most plugged in. Um, so, I don't know. No uh, offense, like to the say future and technology and is, stuff like that. Is, you know? is, is how much I like Vic's essay that's in, that's in the book. And there's two points that. Um, I'll pick up and uh, 
and one is about the ad hoc nature of uh, that. Uh, he talks about how Helen, you know, did the, the was the first one to do the blackmail writing because she couldn't afford letter set, which was actually quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And and what you have to realise is the sort of technology of the day was that you had to you had to paste up a mechanical, and you know, and the only way you couldn't reduce things in size. You know, to, to look at them, and, and so you know, you needed a process camera to make photo mechanicals at all. Mm -hmm. They, you know, and then you can see the change in technology in the book as the fanzines develop, of um, because you could start reducing things on Xerox by yes. about 1979. They, there was another generation of Xerox machines. There's in the city. You'll notice has a color Xerox cover. You know, it was one of the first zines to have a color Xerox cover. Um, what happened with me was that uh, the other thing which. Uh, of course, is now you're very aware of in the internet age is copyright. Of course, nobody ever thought about copyright in those days. It wasn't it wasn't a big deal, but the fact was that you know the, the sort of things that are now being worked out on copyright were kind of worked out within punk. And for me, you know, I was selling badges, and a lot of them, as you know, um, I began off by like paying royalties to the bands. And after a couple of years, I realised that this was like futile. And talking to some of the band, my more successful bands. Um, but uh, it was better to like, I couldn't administer it, I couldn't afford it, or what I did, so what i do it was, what was needed to support the scene, and so this was the ethic, was to really basically support the scene. So instead of paying the bands off, every new band that came in, I'd give them 200 badges free if they brought in their artwork. And, and then eventually, I started to be copied, and the, and the things were just coming, they were on every street corner and market, and so I wanted to keep it as a valid promotional, you know, peer-to-peer -peer medium, so I, that's when I got into fanzines. And, uh, and I bought printing presses and I started giving the same deal to fanzines. You bring it in, we'll, we'll give you a few, we'll print it and we'll distribute it. And if you put jammings in the book, it's the first thing I ever printed and I taught myself to print jamming number five by running that through a printing press. You know, i would never done it before and I, by the end of the printing that I <laughs> learned how to do it. And, um, and so there's, there was, you know, I was eventually criticized for making and you can see the ones with spot color on the cover for making the fanzines look too homogen homogenous because I, you know, I was making the same kind of thing. But um, uh, I just brought a couple of things that, situation three, um, you can see this was made with paper plates where the plate would run down after like, run out after 100 copies. So you had to get one early in the run if it was any good. Um, Jamming, which is uh, not in the thing, uh, or later editions of Jamming, where it became very successful. We were running 5,000 of them. And uh, Tony Fletcher is now a successful author who's re recently written, a, lives here in New York and has written a book about the history. This is to show you, this is what went on before punk, when it was letterpress. You know, this, is, this was in the 60s. And so, you know, when you couldn't even, the offset lipo didn't exist. Um, kill your pet puppy. <laughs> which was uh, a very, very popular fanzine by the same guy who did uh, Ripped and Torn, so in the book. Um, Maximum Speed, which is like a mod magazine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's another Kill Your Pet Puppy. And this was um, when we, I think the first thing I did that had uh, full color on the cover. And then another, uh, an ex-editor from Vogue came in yeah. and took advantage of, of the, my same deal and started a magazine called ID, which you can still, still see on, uh, on newsstands. Um, and uh, when we printed the first ones, this one, we, you know, you can open it up like that. When we printed the first ones, we had staples running down the side. And he said the news agents were returning it because they complained it was scratching up all the other magazines <laughs> in, in, in the newsstand. Okay, so, uh, we've only got seven minutes left for Q&A. Actually, six. <laughs> <laughs> but that was... That was Uh, my question is, this is my burning question of the day. Who in the audience has questions for the panel, please? Ira, we have a we have a big fan person here, in a sense, because Ira had an independent magazine. And maybe tell the people about your independent magazine. I started a magazine called Trouser Press in New York in 1974 and survived until 1984. Um, Unlike a lot of the magazines that you're talking about today, we took it seriously as a as a journalistic endeavor, not simply as a punk endeavor. I mean, we we began before punk. We were never really punks, but we endorsed and supported punk wholeheartedly. Um, 
What, what always struck me was that the number of fanzines that put out first issues and never put out second issues <laughs> always, always kind of felt like they didn't have the journalistic desire that we had. You know, I mean, we really wanted to write. You know, and putting out a magazine was entirely a, uh, an agency for writing. It wasn't, you know, that we had, we wanted to put out a magazine particularly, I just couldn't get published, so we, saw, we thought we would do it ourselves. Oh, that's so interesting, because that's very much the punk DIY setting, and at the same time, totally different from what Vic points out in his essay, which is that Mark P says he wasn't at all, when he did Sniffing Glue, not at all interested in the writing, interested in the ideas. Yeah. People from the floor. <laughs> Jeanette Beckman, punk avatar. <laughs> <laughs> Um, How do you see the, you know, you just very kindly brought this for us to see right there from the front lines. Um, how do you see the, do you see it as a punk manifestation, having been so involved in punk yourself? Well, is punk very relevant now then? Yeah, I did actually go to the demo yesterday and it was... Speak up. Speak up. Everybody hear me? Yeah. I did go to the demonstration yesterday and it was, it did remind me of the old demonstrations used to rock against racism and all those things. There was a lot of mixed kind of messages. Everybody was had their different billboards, you know. There were grannies against, you know, racism and whatever for everything. And it was, it did have a feeling of the old punk era, and I couldn't believe it was more than those in the Square that they'd already printed up, sort of almost like a fancy. This thing which is amazingly called the Occupy Wall Street Journal, which I love the way they wrote that off. I, mean, I think it's actually just so much. Yeah, I do see the time. I'd like to ask anyone in the audience, mm -hmm. because I come from a generation where we made things on paper, yeah. and I'm intrigued with the internet, but uh, there's people here who are the internet generation, and could any one of you tell me if it has the same energy that these objects contained? Because to me, yes. they are more like objects than publications. You know, I don't see them, I see them more as artifacts. Um, but I'm interested in, does the internet, is, is obviously even cheaper, is a totally free medium and more widespread. Does it have the same impact and power to those who use the internet, or, or bloggers, etc.? I will say that some videos do, that are on the internet. Yeah, YouTube. Stuff. And somebody there? Well, I always used, uh, I was a fanzine writer too, uh, and I just like the fanzine culture and the internet culture just so it gave you the information that you were looking for to connect to the people that you like. So that's what it really what I looked at. I didn't look at them as objects, I looked at them as reportage, even if they were these little things like, you know, Skip and Blue or, or something like that. Well, it's kind of fascinating that the, uh, the internet has lowered the bar even further in terms of what it takes to actually express yourself in public so that now, if you look back, fanzine publishing, which was, you know, as, as Nick said, you know, was basically, you know, you knew somebody who knew somebody about a Xerox machine. Now it's like all you have to do is have a phone, and you're an internet publisher. You know? and so, you know, the, the 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 amount of garbage that is now being generated on the internet is is vastly, you know, by geometric numbers, larger than the amount of garbage that any of us could have generated in the '70s with Xerox machines. Because even once, even if we produced them, we then had to find ten people that wanted to buy them. I mean, yeah, when I started my magazine, we stood in front of you know concert halls and sold them for a quarter. You know, but it's all a couple hundred maybe. You know? Yeah, at least you made something. Stella. Yeah, I had a fancy out on the west coast called Stella Z back in the, in, the, in the late 70s. And for us, the scene was so tiny, and there were no band, there was no venue for the bands to play. There was absolutely no coverage or anything like that. So it was the only way to communicate with each other the things that you were interested in, whether it was bands or or other sort of stuff. Um, and I. I did Stellazine with one other person, so I wrote all the pieces under different names to make it look like we had a lot of people. <laughs> and when we started out with the Xerox machine, we used to take uh, photos and screen them, black and white photos, and screen them, and then use them in the paper. So we we found another technology, technological way of making the images look good, even though we were using Xerox. And then we went to we went to um, tabloid newspaper because the, there was one publishing company that would sneak us in on the down period between big jobs, uh -huh. and they would just charge us almost nothing to shoot off ours in between what they were, what they were really doing. 
you know, but it was really just a way of communicating with the, sh the few people that were actually interested. I was in Seattle in those days, and it was maybe 50 people. Yes. And then there was San Francisco, there was Portland, San Francisco, and LA, and Vancouver. And so there was like a there was like a line of communication where bands would go up and down, and information would pass up and down. But the scenes weren't really big. There was just no way to know what anybody else was doing or thinking without having a fancy to find out. I, I mean, I mean, what I would observe about kind of what people are saying in general is, is that, and what makes them so interesting as artifacts is that all of those aesthetic qualities are almost an afterthought. That the, the information came first, and it was, and so it was, I mean, not that, that, not that it was... I don't know. Well, not, from my point of view, I don't agree, because it but, was being an artist, and, and the visual was very important to us. But, 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 you're, but, the, what I, but what I'm hearing you say is that you were using the screens to make the photos look better. Well, yeah, because we couldn't paste the, the photos on the on oh, each right. copy. We had, right. We had to run off the copy. Right, but but so but so the, the aesthetics are important. But it's that it's that we oh, we want we want that we want that photo that photo to come out. Okay. You're, it's, so, so but so that it's that it's a lot of the way that the the, the zines look are a consequence of, of the medium and and people and, and working around the limitations of the medium and. But it's it's kind of a secondary thing, and it's you're bumping your head up against what you can do with what your budget is, as opposed to we have a, a budget and we can just make it look any well, way we, we want. We fell in between the idea of a traditional journalist publication and something else because we did things like we had um, puzzles that you would cut out pieces that we sprinkled through the magazine and paste them on something that was on the back cover, right. or we would you could turn you could twist the pages and turn it into some kind of an origami thing. Right. So we, were that, well, that, we have a lot of. Sorry, sorry no, 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 he's a cat. Well, I I well, I'm going to go back to. I had two points from your essay, and the second one <laughs> was was, uh, was the the people who were making the fan scenes in England mm -hmm. were young. Right. They were like 14, 15 years old, and so they didn't have. You know, I'm sure you were I a little older when you, yes, you when you were doing. And this is what amazed me when I came to America and found that the whole punk scene was like. 18 or 21 and up, whereas in England, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, it was all, four, it was 14 yeah. to like 18 that's years old, and that's one of the things that you see in this. No, right and we have other questions from the floor. Actually, the gentleman in the back was first. He put his hand, you put your hand up a while ago. I, no, I was just going to say, Graham, I'm, I'm younger than all of them. <laughs> Actually, he's <laughs> younger than springtime. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, carry on. Well, anyway. Uh, I, I got into it probably around 1980 or whatever, but there had to be a passion that was involved there. Like growing up in London, if you didn't read enemy sounds or melody making, you didn't know what was going on. You didn't know what bands were playing or anything like that. So really, uh, like what she's saying uh, about a uh, uh, small, like these individuals, and like-minded individuals, really come together. And I mean, in 1980, we were putting out photocopies that were all cut together, or whatever. For different friends' bands and things. And I remember the crass, some of the crass ones were awful, some of the photocopies. <laughs> but a lot of the, uh, like, well, the trouser press guy was saying, a lot of the, the uh, fanzines, like, after about 82, 83, they really got diluted with just, like, you know, they were, they, and so things like ID came along, which really was, like, a glamorized uh, fanzine. It had photographs of people on the street, street yeah. Uh, whatever it came across as being a bit more polished because you know, I was just at my parents' house last week and I was going through old stuff and I was like, why did I buy that? <laughs> but then I found other things like uh, like Zigzag magazine that was very similar to a, uh, a fanzine as well. So it was small, but it was the passion that went into it, and that's one thing that you'll forget. Like the whole punk movement or anything, it comes from the passion of actually doing it. Yeah. And wanting to be a part of the scene and wanting to know what was going on. So you had to be a part of the scene to be a part of the scene or yeah. to look around and discover it. And that's where the fanzine was so important. Thanks so very much for being so Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Wow, what an amazing, amazing uh, panel and uh, amount of information. So thanks very much. Um, I was an American punk, uh, grew up in the suburbs in the 80s. I published a fanzine called Read This Zine. Uh, we published four issues. And I have a comment and a question for Jake. Jolly. J O L Y. Yeah. Um, my, my comment is about style and how important style was in the punk scene and how important style was to zines as well. I think that it wasn't as much of 
at least in my case, I didn't feel like it was as much of a journalistic endeavor as it was a style endeavor. Um, so it, 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 just like the music was, you know, just like the fact that, you know, there were very strict limitations, but it was a self-expression. Um, the question is a technical one. I noticed that in the exhibition that there was a split fountain effect. There was like three colors blended into each other. And that would have been a wet dream for us. It's funny, a guy at the, I was at the other, the other fanzine exhibition last night, and a guy asked me the same question, you know, um, about it. He said, what do you call that? And I had to go away and think about it. And I said, we used to call it a wash. Uh -huh. But, it, you know, you just throw in, throw in the ink across the across the, you know, so you across, literally across the three thing. strips of your, other, your first point is much better. Your point about style yeah. and, <laughs> and not, the, not the music be press. Yeah. No, the music <laughs> press that he talk, talks about, um, you know, it was a strictly text and, you know, and the image, but it was basically, it was about writing. And so this is what really changed your right in the fanzines was that it was about style and about, you know, even rough style. And we changed the media in England but you know, before punk, there was it was straight newspaper type style, and afterwards it was smash hits. You know, bang up a picture of the band, sling it at an angle, print the lyric like this. You know what I mean, or something, but much more straight image. And I mean, that was a consequence. Of it. it was not like the punk movement was this monolithic, monolithic thing from the beginning to the end. It's like the, that first wave of punk. It was, it was that that era when you had. Hip hop and punk and reggae, and, and it was about these ideas uh, over the graphic, graphical style. I mean, to right. you know, the music and graphical style is a right. But and the, but there was a certain amount of content, and then when it kind of got the second wave, it it, it became it, it's it's like with, with the printing. It's sort of like it got a little washed out, and it got a little, and so that people started getting this kind of rigid mindset about you know. You know, I need to wear, you know, my docks with the certain color laces, and the and the and the style became more codified as it as it went along, and so that it was maybe more about style. Not that there wasn't content, but just that it I things mean, got a little more rigid. Because, because, more because, right. because, right. because then you see where it got to. Because really, you know, eighty three to eighty six was was post. Yeah, post -mortal. I think initially you'll see in seventy six, seventy seven what they call cut and paste DIY culture. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see B-movie imagery cut and pasted in there, appropriated or found images. And then in the 80s, you get this, what I call the sort of advent of style. <laughs> with, um, da, 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 da. Like people like Neville Brody and yeah. um, you know, from Joy Division, New Order. And they kind of rediscovered the Bauhaus and futurism and stuff. And then, then that's the, yeah, yeah. that becomes incorporated in it. And then you've got the anarcho punk zines, which are kind of waving the flag for the true spirit of punk or whatever. And they're very singular in their style. So um, in the 80s, it's kind of quite diverse, and you've got like a mod revival. And you see all that in the book, in fact. Yeah. And that's interesting. So it isn't like a dead kind of thing, punk. It really mm. does develop. And, um, yeah. But you're yes. also talking, when you're talking about the 80s, that's when bands started to be signed and things became part of the mainstream. So everything broke off into their own little... Yeah, well, yeah, you, 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 you can't forget, forget the hardcore scene in the 80s. Yeah, it was in, totally... In, I remember we're talking about British, British, British right. stuff here, which we didn't have hardcore, but we did have crass, anarcho-punk, and the indie scene, and etc. Yeah. Wasn't there some... Yeah, this gentleman in here, I, over here. I have a question regarding questions for about the <laughs> internet. Uh, Dan yeah. Salsa. Culture, thanks. Um, you're saying whether does the internet have the same kind of uh, power and how does that relate to like zine culture? And I think you know, absolutely it does. And those of us who are more of the internet era take advantage of that and have used that and it's been this amazing way to express yourself. But at the same time, the huge amount of noise and the sort of transient, temporary whatever nature of the internet, I think has you know, made people turn back to physicality of objects, and you see that a lot here, whether it's limited edition cassettes and vinyl, or uh, returns of mimeograph and letter set. And some of it maybe is, is a, sort of a superficial recreation of, you know, we've been sitting in front of a computer for so long, so we want to get our hands dirty kind of yeah. thing, but on the other hand, it's also very much, there's so much digital noise out there, we need to make something special and physical yes. that's permanent. 
gentlemen, that, that's a beautiful point. Thank um, you. I, Pete Domachinsky. I'm not really, I haven't really been involved in the punk movement, but I've been involved in this publishing thing. And, uh, we tried to put together a magazine in 1980, and we got cast. We didn't get past issue one for many reasons, not just uh, commitment. It was like you had five people working together, and then they all fought against each other. Oh, so yeah. they kind of so, and <laughs> then the people who were, <laughs> who were submitting, it became such a problem that there was like one person, and it's very difficult to do. And and with with what you're talking about with internet stuff, because I've been, you know, publishing and been published through that whole era from this late 60s, 70s, through, I think the, the internet started to hurt that quality. Because I think tomorrow, if someone in this room puts out a book that I can touch, yeah. it becomes an artifact almost immediately. Because it's you can touch it, you can put it on your shelf. If you're the person who whose book it is, you have, I hate to use that hard word, someone called it a unit yesterday, which is disgusting, but it's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of, Brought up. I'm going far away next week to do some stuff. I want to have stuff people can touch and look at and maybe even buy. So, I mean, the internet, you know, in a way helped me and a lot of other people I know with their work. And I made a joke about two years ago. You know, I used to say, ah, I never get rejected on the internet. And then I <laughs> sent, sent out this huge email using that device saying, I got my first internet rejection, you know, and I actually felt really good. That's, thank God these assholes in cyberspace finally rejected me. That is very, very it's so, tough, isn't it? It's just, it's just too intangible. Even print on demand stuff is intangible because, you know, you have to demand people to uh, print. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of nuts. This lady over here, you had a question? Yeah, well, uh, just to comment more to your stuff and as well, the internet uh, stuff being solidly born in the internet generation, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, zines were definitely still very valid, especially the punk DIY indie culture. You know, and no one's really mentioned like Riot Girl stuff and things like that. That was like... That's your uh, job! Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that, was, that was definitely like the, the lifeline for me in a lot of ways, yeah. and as far as politics went. I mean, that's where I was finding a lot more radical politics. It wasn't in the library, unfortunately. It wasn't on the internet yet, you know, it, it, even though the internet was, was definitely becoming a thing. You know, it's also where I found distros for music, for bands around the country and from other countries that, you know, you weren't able to find because they were in someone's basement, but they could have enough money to, you know, have an ad in the back page of someone's zine somewhere, and then it's traveled in someone's tour van, you know, that you got for a dollar halfway across the country, and now you're you're linking up to all these things. And you know, meanwhile, there's, there's you know, the internet that's growing, but this seems so much faster and more direct in so many huh. ways. And I, and I think that it's still relevant even now, like decades, decades later, now that I'm older, you know, I'm, I'm here I am in a book arts program making books that's very solidly grounded in the history of, of zines, of mail art, okay. of all these different things that actually keeps coming up in a lot of the talks today as well. Um, Mexican stuff earlier this morning, mm -hmm. um, and then with the internet, like even becoming more faster, and like telling, like uh, what the gentleman talked about with the phones, and how anyone can publish with, with phones now. I'm seeing indie music movements and, and political stuff a return back to hand printing and xeroxing and making things because people want that yeah, in their hands. They want to feel the texture. They want to see the colors bleed. You know, they, they want to be able to buy it from someone at a table at a show. Right. You know, like yeah. that's it's a fetish a shop. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, half the people out there are printing, also. you know, yeah. the guys I know in publishing out there, they're all printing stuff that's from the 70s and 80s. They're just reprinting. Yeah. And, and Mail Art people, one of the founders of Mail Art, a really important guy who went only internet because of the price of postage keep going up and whatnot, he just, he's sending out Facebook things to everybody. I'm going mail on. Now he's putting the postcards he's sending and getting again. So it's 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 a it's a matter of tangibility. That's the yeah. Did he hear we have to wrap up? You think so? Our time is up. Well, thank you. You have this link. Just let us. Yeah. 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 She didn't want to be video. Actually, part of the point that I'm about to make is that um, it's really hard to have this sort of DIY culture and aesthetic and everything because. If I even go to see a show, I can't go without getting photographed. 
there are six photographers at every shitty punk show that I go to. And it, you know, any time a band even emerges on the scene, it's so, it, it's automatically and instantaneously distributed. There's no incubation period. There's no time for things to sort of grow. Oh, that's true. And, they, and every time something comes out, it's so immediately commodified and marketed yeah. that I instantaneously start to hate it. Something that I, I loved just a minute ago. And um, as a relatively young person, let's just generally say between 20 and 30, um, I started going to shows at, you know, around maybe 96, and something felt different. You know, you, you found out about it from other people. You, I, I grew up in the suburbs. You, my mom drove me to, to shitty bars and strip malls. You know, and there was something that felt really honest and really pure about that. And um, although it's really nice to find out about stuff on the internet and the, the accessibility of all that, um, I think even so much as in the aesthetic that everyone's sort of adopting, like, again, now we're not videotaping me, but if you look at my outfit, I'm dressed in clothes that you could see someone wearing 40 years ago. Where's the innovation? Where's, where's youth culture? Where's our style? Where's our identity? Uh, if you look around Brooklyn, everyone looks like they're just, they burnt off their grandparents' closets. Yeah. Uh -oh. like, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's true actually. I had discussions about that with Don Letts, a sort of punk filmmaker and documentarian, because we were saying, you know, the, the ripped tights and the cognitive dissonance of wearing, you know, ripped fishnets with a ball gown and combat boots. And of course, the people like Lily Allen have made that the big look, you know. And so, where are the new statements? And there there speaks the punk. Hey guys, <laughs> it's been a fantastic. <laughs>